Welcome to Thinking Green. I'm Rana. And just to let you know, this show is being taped a day before you are watching it. The only downside is you won't be able to call in with questions. But by the end of the show, if you have questions, I think you'll be able to figure out where to direct them. <laughs> so um, today's guest is Luther Weeks from uh, Connecticut Voters Count. And he's traditionally, for many years, been uh, my guest right after the election because he's sort of the expert that lets us know how things went. And um, we talk about different issues and ways that we, as citizens, can help make things better, at least in our state in the future. So uh, welcome, Luther. Hi. Good to be here again. <laughs> yeah. You know, you've become a, a New London tradition, which is, which is really good. Um, I guess start out, um, you're probably familiar with a lot of the people who watch the show, but talk about uh, the organization Connecticut Voters Count and the Citizens Audit and how you got wrapped up in all of this. Sure. So uh, the, uh, Connecticut Voters Count is really uh, more my blog where you'll see my opinion. Uh, and it's also an archive of things uh, that happen in Connecticut for uh, Connecticut residents and the rest of the world. Uh, having to do with election integrity, and it's also where I bring to Connecticut residents information that I think is relative, relevant from around the uh, country and uh, very occasionally around the world. Uh, but the Connecticut Citizen Election Audit, ctelectionaudit.org, uh, what we do is we observe the post-election audits uh, that Connecticut has after every election since 2007, and we provide an independent report on that uh, to the public so it can see how things uh, went. And we also do our own audits occasionally. Uh, the last two years, and not this year, but the last two years, we've audited the websites of all 169 towns uh, in the state of Connecticut to see how they're serving the voters of Connecticut. What did you find? <laughs> Um, we found there's a lot of room for improvement, okay? The websites uh, could easily provide the information voters want. They could, they could point to places on the Secretary of State's website. They could provide a little bit more information, uh, but they don't have uh, primarily information that voters want. And some of them even had the wrong election date last year, long by a day late because it was a year old. They also had the wrong deadlines for registration, wrong by a day late. Uh, so some people might have just missed it. Right, and a lot of uh, them, don't have the mo them don't have the most basic information, uh, like the phone numbers for the registrars, uh, like the date of the next election. Uh, you know, they have the bake sales on there and, and other kinds of things. Uh, they have the town council meeting and the umpteen board meetings that go on, but they just ignore uh, that there's an election going on quite often. Wow, that's kind of shocking. But what I wanted to start out with is, you know, there was a big presidential election a week ago, and um, what happened in 2000 also happened in 2016, that the winner of the popular vote was not the winner coming out, or will likely not be the winner coming out of the Electoral College. And uh, so we have a lot of people wondering if this is a problem, the mismatch, and if it's a problem, what we should do about it. So I'm going to start with something that I, people have been talking about, the National Popular Vote uh, Compact. And 
it's been presented as one possible solution. Uh, can you talk about it, what it is, and also yeah. what you think about it? So, yeah, let me just, just start with a couple of uh, basic assumptions that I think uh, are an error. Uh, first, uh, there's, you know, maybe there's a little reason to believe right now that Hillary Clinton might have won a national popular vote. But there's no real reason to uh, say for sure that Al Gore won the national popular vote. Because there's actually, a, a, you know, it's... it's we like, don't really know. It's like, in the, yeah, making the sausage in the sausage factory. Um, we, that's a, that's a, an unaudited, um, error-prone number that's known as the national popular vote. Uh, so, you know, that, I don't have any particular confidence that that number is accurate. But beyond that, if I listen to the people that, and I agree with the people uh, that promote the National Popular Vote Compact, that a lot more and different people would vote if we had the National Popular Vote uh, in, in this nation, one way or another. So therefore, we have no idea under a National Popular Vote who would have won the election in 2000 or that won the election in 2000. And, right, because and voter turnout would voter, have been Yeah, affected. I mean, you know, honestly, there's a lot of people in Connecticut, and you know that, that say, I'm a Democrat. So I'm not going to bother going to vote for Hillary because I know she's going to win anyway. And Republicans say, way, you know, Trump or whoever is going to lose. And I know it. And why should I bother voting in Connecticut? So... If we had a national popular vote, you'd have more Republicans who vote in Connecticut, more Democrats vote in Connecticut, and you'd have the same thing in like Oklahoma, where I think uh, Mr. Trump won by about you know 70 percent or something like that. So we have no idea what would have happened in 2000 if we had a national popular vote, and we'd have no idea this time. So that's you know that's an interesting thing for people to contemplate. So what's wrong with the national popular vote compact? Okay, and by the way, I'm theoretically I'm in favor of national popular vote. Okay, most yeah. of Europe has a national popular vote. Are, um, are there any other uh, countries to get a little bit off track that have a system like ours with the Electoral College? or Only in the sense that you have some countries with a parliamentary system like England. So, so it, you're it's, it's for the something party. like, yeah, or, well, yeah, it's voting for the party and the people, you know, coalitions and stuff in there elect the. Mm -hmm. The prime minister may be a little bit like what we have. Uh, but the other thing is there's no other co no country in Europe that has this state-by-state, town-by-town right. election system, no country in the world that has that. So what you have is in the compact is a mismatch to our election system versus the, the way we elect the president. So the compact, we have a system that's highly flawed, okay, where we don't audit our elections. We don't have a uniform franchise from state to state. And uh, we have a lot of voter suppression going on in different states. Um, and the other side would argue we have sort of the opposite, where we're enfranchising too many people. And it's, you know. So that, that means we're cobbling, uh, co the compact is cobbling onto a flawed state by state system. A system that's really only fair mm -hmm. if the whole system is uniform and fair. Uh, so it would actually, uh, from my standpoint, cause a lot more skullduggery and a lot more uh, issues than, uh, you know, our current system has. Uh, so if we were to have a national popular vote, we would need a constitutional amendment. It has to override the 12th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, some parts, other parts hmm. of the Constitution, and something known as the Electoral Count Act. And if you don't really understand the Twelfth Amendment and the Electoral okay. Count Act, then uh, you know I, yeah, yeah, I don't necessarily expect that uh, you'll you'll be able to understand mm -hmm. uh, you know what my concerns are, other than uh, believe me. Well, okay. So, what could be done? Is th are there any ways to tweak our, our system? You've already mentioned that uh, in Connecticut, in places that are not swing states, voters are kind of disincentivized to even come to the polls because yeah. especially if it's a not a swing state and you don't have many electoral votes either uh, but also um, I well there was a suggestion that the, the electoral votes that each state has is based on the number of congressmen plus right. the two senators right and 
we know that the Senate is weighted towards you know, the heartland states that are not densely populated. Smaller states, like Connecticut is sort of one of the bigger small states. We are, and because we, we have a, re yeah, we have a relative, we don't have a, a lot of population, but relative to our land size, uh, we do. I, I know I was looking up North Dakota for, for a totally different reason. Yeah. And North Dakota has, a, you know, quite a bit more land mass than, Connecticut, but right. only a fifth of the population. Right. So um, they have fewer um, electoral votes than Connecticut, but not in proportion to how much less the right. population right. is. Exactly. So um, I heard it recommended, would it ever be approved that the number of electors would be tied to just the number of Congress people or only the number of Congress people plus one rather than plus two? Well, once again, that's a that's a constitutional amendment. So you can't do anything without. Yeah, the and I mean, I'm skeptical. Uh, you know, I mean, I'd like to see a, con a constitutional amendment for the national popular vote with some lots of other safeguards in there, uh, but I, I don't think that I you know I just don't think that's very realistic to expect that to happen. Uh, you know, at least in the next few years. Well, I mean, the Equal Rights Amendment couldn't pass in a much more liberal period than, than we have now. Uh, I think, you know, it's a, it's a big road to hoe. I, but I'd be in favor yeah. of the national popular vote under, you know, a sufficient constitutional amendment. Yeah, and, and actually I think this would be, realistically speaking, a harder push than the Equal Rights Amendment, not just because the country's gone uh, more conservative, but the people who are in office kind of benefit from the system we have. Which, whichever system, wherever they are, whether it's in Connecticut what? State or if it's in, you know, different states. And, and, and overall, of course, it's, yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah it, it's different, yeah. Yeah, so inertia is, is really a force if you're talking about, you know, where is the leadership going to come from for this constitutional amendment? Certainly not from, you know, the senators in the Midwest or, Sure. You know, or the people within a Trump presidency, you know, administration, yeah. uh, you know, so, what's so, in it for them? Well, I do think it's interesting that, you know, some of my friends that uh, are in favor of the compact, we're pointing out, Michael Moore has talked about, uh, you know, uh, this. And then some of the people on the other side have talked about, well, Eric Holder is in favor of it, which... Well, I noticed both of them were in favor of con constitutional amendment. They did not come out in favor of the compact. So I was very appreciative oh, to see that. Oh, that is interesting. Yeah, I was appreciative to see that. Um, you know, I think, I mean, a constitutional amendment is a long road to hold to get passed, but I think it's a long road to get one that I would call sufficient. Well, and I know you're like a devil's in the details sort of right. person. Right. So what would the constitutional amendment have to address? Because it would yeah. make some pretty wide sweeping changes. Yeah, I think, well, of course it has to override some laws that stop. But you, you, would, you would probably first of all, and I think Michael Moore listed this, when you, you would probably want to have paper ballots nationwide. That's a good idea anyway, yeah. by yeah. the way. Yeah, so you want to have an equal franchise nationwide. And that, that to me means you know, if some states say felons can't vote, well, then all states should say that, or they should all say felons can vote. On, you know, and there's or they can you know, vote like, after they've served you're their after time they're out or... of jail, or you know, whatever, whatever you know is uniform. Um, you know, if you want to have voter ID laws, they should be uniform. Okay, to the extent that they're you know whatever they are, they should be uniform from state to state. So the whole franchise should be uniform. There ought to be protections against uh, purging rolls in certain ways. There, you know, if there's early voting, uh, if there's um, election day registration, that ought to be a uniform right. kind of system uh, nationwide. And you know, just as important as all that is, we need to have some kind of audit that we can have confidence in, and some kind of recount laws that we can have And they would also have to be consistent on a state-by-state -state basis. Right, and you know, and you know, the, the national popular vote guys behind the compact talked about recounts and how states do recounts and a recount would be possible under the compact. Well, that's not true. Uh, it's about half the states have recounts of some type or another. 
But all those recounts are uh, based on close margins within a particular state. So sure, that, means nothing if, that means nothing if you have a close election nationwide. But um, maybe not, not close at all within your state. Right. And the other thing is the compact only applies to the states that sign it. So, you know, let's, so states representing half the electoral votes sign it. Even if the compact were changed so it required a recount, it would only apply to the states that are in the compact. Okay. So, uh, you know, and even con like Connecticut has an audit, but, you know, we've had a discussion out of the half the states that have an audit, we had discussion online, which one has a model that other states should follow that's really good? Um, we're up to one where somebody hasn't refuted that that's a good audit. All the rest of them, you know, there's a couple that I thought were pretty good. Uh, but, you know, we don't even have a s states now that have good post-election audits. Uh, Connecticut doesn't audit our results. We just audit uh, some of the results from some of our machines. Um, you know, so there's, there's a long way to go everywhere. So did anything... Bringing uh, this back a little bit to um, to Connecticut, uh, how did Election Day go in our state? Well, uh, I think, it, you know, by and large, it went pretty well. I think there were a couple problems. Now, originally, uh, Secretary of State gave, uh, the, you know, the election officials an A-minus in Connecticut, an election, of course, that she's in charge. Uh, uh, then uh, the next day, some of the results weren't reported in time. And she was blaming all the election officials. But then it came out that, you know, Bridgeport, for example, the state had set the uh, election up incorrectly. So they went to put in the data and they said, oh, this is the wrong candidates for some of the offices oh here. Oh, my goodness. And so the state fixed that. They put it all in again. And then the whole system went down. All the results went away. Uh, and I think it's, it's now come back. And if you look, yeah. at, the, if you look at the system uh, right now, uh, it says unofficial results. Now that's probably right. appropriate because the results haven't been certified yet. But on the other hand, there's a lot of data the state collects that they haven't made available to the public. So it's very hard to tell how accurate the results are that are uh, online right now. So, and that's, you know, Connecticut's just one state like that. Uh, some friends of mine in another state were trying to find the undervote levels. And that's how many people came in and yeah. didn't vote for president. Right. Because mm. it's higher than normal, and that's understandable for a right. variety of reasons. This, but they were, they were looking at this particular state, and they can't interpret the data right. They don't know how, how to read the data to figure that out. And then they found another one had an undervote of 9%. That means 9 is 9%. That means 9% more people voted Th than were... Uh, than there were ballots? Than they were, than they were signed in. Okay, then, then, then there were ballots. They voted... In a, so... But, you know, I mean, that's probably, uh, you know, just a, some kind of a transcription error or something like that. But we got that all over the country. So that's why I say we don't, you know, it, it, you can allege that Hillary Clinton uh, won the national popular vote. And it's probably true. But, you know, it's more likely true than not. But we don't know what those numbers are. We really can't trust those numbers. And we never can because nobody's going to go back and correct everything. Uh, why are you going to correct them in, in Oklahoma? I mean, you know darn well Trump won Oklahoma. Why, you know, I don't care about the last few thousand votes in Oklahoma, whether they're accurate or not. But there's other states where it might be a lot more important, like, say, Florida. Well, as a general thing, I have to tell you, uh, I referred uh, earlier to our you know, high-profile referendum that we had in New London five years ago. Yeah. And I recently went to the Secretary of State's website to look at 2011 results. And I wasn't looking for that one in particular. Uh, yeah. I was looking for uh, municipal office right. holders' results. But I noticed that the numbers on the Secretary of State's website still reflected the initial uh, numbers that had shown that that referendum went one way towards the yeses yeah. when the recount, the recanvas, turned it the other way. Right. Uh, and the secretary, if someone who was just looking at the Secretary of State's website would say, oh, yeah. you know, that park was sold, except right. it wasn't. And, and, and when you mentioned the uh, negative undercount, that was actually one of the issues that they're 
that, that right. came up with, in, uh, there were people who had voted um, right in absentee, right. and those ballots were both put through the machine, and the assumption was made that the machine had not picked up those votes on the referendum, right. but it had, so they were hand counted as well. Yeah. Yeah. So we had about 40 votes that were yeah. counted twice. Right, and, w and you know what's, what's wrong is not that somebody made a mistake. Right. Is that it wasn't caught four times before uh, the results were certified. You know, it, it should have been caught on it's election night, but it should have been caught by the town clerk, uh, you know, a week later or whenever they, yeah. you, you I know. know I know, that's, yeah. Uh, that's, you know, and we had an instance in our polling place this time, and we were emptying, emptying the ballot box because it was getting full, and, you know, and just make sure that there was plenty of room in it. And I noticed this one fellow who was helping us was grabbing the write-in ballots and putting them away. And, you know, I mean, it's a natural mistake. He's just grabbing, you know, grabbing yeah. all the ballots. But I said, no, those write-ins got to stay in the bin. And fortunately, we yeah. were filling a new bag. We had already filled up one. Wow. But we had to go through like a thousand ballots and find all the write-in votes and put them back in the write-in bin. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with him making a mistake, and I'm glad we caught it when we did, because uh, if we had caught it uh, later on at night, you know, when we were closing, we would have been back there for two hours going through almost 4,000 ballots to find all these 56 or 58 write-in votes that we had. It would have been interspersed with everything. Would have been, uh, well, it could have been subject to that, so we would have really needed to go through everything. So. Uh, you know, but there's nothing wrong with making a mistake as long as you surface it and do a, a reasonable thing to correct it. I mean, there's some uncorrectable mistakes. Fortunately, with paper ballots and all that, um, you know, you're immune to a lot of uncorrectable mistakes that you can always go to that paper if it's preserved properly and, uh, you know, you can uh, correct the mistake. Now, you, you've talked uh, quite a bit about, uh, you know, enfranchisement and of course it's been a huge and kind of emotional issue I guess um, does voter fraud exist like do people come who, to the polls who aren't citizens or uh, is this really a problem yeah um, and you know what if, if that is or isn't the problem what other potential problems are there with yeah. uh, people's uh, ability to actually cast their ballot. Right. So, you know, first of all, there, there, you know, all the studies and everything, has, there's very little uh, voter fraud, which I define as in a polling place. Fraud by a voter, where they intentionally vote where or when they shouldn't have, shouldn't, or illegally, or multiple times or whatever, you know, no, very, very little. Um, you know, many people say all, all these immigrants are, you have driver's licenses in Connecticut. Well, those are a separate kind of driver's license, and you can't register with them. Uh, you know, and I would say if I was an immigrant, illegal especially, um, I'm a heads-down person. I don't want to get a traffic ticket. I don't want to do anything because if I get caught in that, I'm subject to, you know, it's, it's dangerous. Well, it is a honestly, you know, to honestly, cast a I, you vote. know, I hate to tell you this, but a single vote in Connecticut isn't always worth that much. Once in a while, it is, but by and large, a single vote anywhere isn't worth all that much. So, for an immigrant to to risk voting, uh, you know, is a crazy, crazy thing. And I'd say for the average voter or most voters, I mean, if you get caught, the fines and jail time and all that, it's not worth it. Uh, absentee voting is where we have seen fraud in Connecticut. Hmm. And, you know, I say most of that is what I call is organized fraud. Okay? And it doesn't mean that, the, you know, it's uh, or voting fraud versus voter fraud. And it doesn't mean right. there's a huge conspiracy. All you need is, you know, one or two people doing a scheme that, you know, harvest absentee ballots in one way or another. Uh, you know, maybe the minor one is, you know, husband helps the wife, helps the wife vote. Sure. 
Uh, we've had some people arrested uh, nationwide for voting their children's vote. They ordered absentee ballots for their children's way to college, and their children didn't even know it, and they did the whole job. Uh, and there's people, ha has but there's people paying a huge like fine for that. Nursing homes as well with elderly populations. Yeah, a week would almost talk a, a long time about that. And my wife has, uh, for the last two years, has been part of supervised absentee voting. And it's one of those things that's uh, you know pretty bad, other than the alternatives. That's what I would say. But you could spend all day on that. I'll just say that you know I think everybody's agreement is what we do in that isn't isn't the greatest. But the alternative to it of not having it supervised with representatives of both uh, major parties watching while somebody's doing their absentee vote or, or helping them with it in the nursing homes, the alternative is probably worse. Uh, so, yeah, but the other side of absentee voting is, you know, absentee votes, there's no voter ID with that. Okay, so, right. you know, some of my friends in uh, Colorado, the you know, legislators are all wild about we ought to have tougher ID laws, and they're pointing out, look, we're 70% mail-in votes, and there's no ID with that. So, you know, that's, you know, if you want to do voter fraud, you know, or voting fraud, absentee balloting or mail-in balloting, and that's why I'm concerned about going to all-mail voting, uh, and not the kind we had before 1920. <laughs> but you know that's that's you know but and you know and and our problems with accounting and not having audits in that uh, leave a lot more room for insider fraud. The biggest and the most vulnerable part of our election system everywhere is insider fraud, and some of that could be on absentee ballots, but some of it can right. just be changing results or. You know, whatever else. So we're worried about the Russians hacking in and all that. I was just there are about the Russians. there are concerns about hacking in and all that as a concern, but I would say insider fraud and and you know people that say we don't like our military policy, they take that like you're hurting the troops. You're against yeah. you're hurting the poor troop out there, insulting veterans if you say we shouldn't attack another country. Well, it's a little like that in voting. If, if you say our voting systems are vulnerable and somebody might go and tweak the results in the back room somewhere, then you're insulting every uh, person that's recruited to be a poll worker. No, we're yeah. not. You know, we're saying that there's some, there could be some bad apples in there. They don't even have to be election officials. It could right. be somebody in the mail room at your town hall. Uh, but, you know, somehow, uh, you know, Every, every uh, poll worker has control of the entire election, and you're insulting every one of them by suggesting there's a problem. And you think that many of them, them who are serious actually themselves would like to see the problems minimized. Yeah. Uh, now, you mentioned, uh, you know, in a different way, our service people, but talking about enfranchisement uh, is the way that our service people abroad uh, vote is that working for them or not? Okay. In my opinion, it should be working for them. Um, you know, we have special laws now that absentee ballots have to go to service people 45 days before the election. Uh, they also have to be able to download blank ballots from uh, the websites of, like, the Secretaries of State nationwide. Uh, in returning those ballots, they, they have to be able to, um, you know, most uh, federal elections, they can have a free uh, express return, like DHL, express return. So that takes maybe a week or so, but if they vote a week or so before the election and they use those advantages, the problem is uh, there's two real problems. Uh, in every military base, you have an officer assigned as sort of an officer to help people with voting. But that's just a side job for somebody. That's a little part of a job for one officer in a base. And they, might have, they have 50 state laws to deal with and all that stuff. So, uh, in, you know, the military doesn't take, do their part to, to take responsibility mm. for this. You know, when I was in the military, my stepfather died. In 15 minutes, I got a call way over in Korea, and this is the early 70s, what? to go down and talk to the chaplain who explained this to me, that that had happened. It wasn't too sudden. So, you know, it wasn't. But if they can do that, 
you know, they can provide a service. They have to, the military has to not throw their hands up and say it's, because people talked about, well, they should do online voting because these guys are out in the field and all that, and they can't. Well, wait a minute. If you can do online voting, you've got a computer terminal there out in the field, uh, you should be able to have something to print something out to print a ballot that you can vote on just as easily sure. as go on the Internet. You know, so, uh, and they've studied it. And it's, and since 2012, everything is, including 2012, mm -hmm. everything include, improved dramatically. Um, a, a very partisan person in the federal government that was responsible for assisting military in voting did statistics, and his view was demographically the soldiers were voting at the same level that oh. their peers were voting. Oh. Okay, so, and you know, all, all up and down the line. Because you figure, you know, a lot of times younger voters are, at that lower age who might not be anywhere near home and not right. have any idea except. Right. Yeah, maybe to press. So they, they don't vote the same level as other people do, uh, but they voted about the same level as their demographic would indicate. Um, and you know, and you know, something like ninety-five percent of the ballots that were mailed were received within a week of when they were hmm. mailed. That kind of stuff. They studied that. Oh, They're wow. mailed by, you know, the express return. Yes. And the other side is the hard part is mailing out to the to military because they move around so fast you don't know where you mail out to them. So if they mail in the ballot, your election office isn't moving. Uh, you know, that's, that's the easy part. That's why having the ballots available on the Internet. And they also have special ballots for the military yeah. so they can say, oh, I'm voting all Republican, I'm all voting all Democrat, or just vote for president or just... You know, so they can vote in the federal part of the election, not the local part, without even getting a ballot. Oh, wow. I didn't yeah. And they've had that for that. a year. They've had, it's called overseas ballots. Now, how do you feel about, uh, you mentioned that you have some concerns about the mail-in ballots because, right. you know, you don't know where they're coming from, right. really. Uh, how do you feel about early voting? I'm in favor of in-person early voting, Okay. But I don't think it should be a long period of time. It should be like a week. Um, this is a good example in this election. I think people might have been changing their mind later, and you're telling them vote three weeks ago or something. I think it ought to be a reasonable period of time, maybe 10 days. You know, that's okay. Uh, and I would do a compromise in Connecticut. In, in some states, they have these voting centers where people go to them and all that, and that works because they have county-wide election administration. Right. We have a local town election administration. So to say to, to Hartford and New Haven, you've got to have one polling place open or two polling places for 10 days, well, great. They've got 20 or 30 polling places. Right. So, you know, it adds 10 percent, 15 percent to their cost to Election Day. But to ask... Uh, a town with a single polling place to have right. it open for 10 days or seven days where now they only have it open for one day um you know that's that's quite a that's quite a, but if you don't do that kind of thing then it's an unfair voting system it's an unequal voting right. system but you know like if you're voting absentee and i think it's the same in all towns my town after a certain date after the ballots are available i can go to the town clerk's office give them my absentee ballot application yeah. Fill out my ballot right there and give it to the town clerk. Or right. What? Well, I think that would be, uh, you know, a, I accept that as a good method of early voting. Either sure. you have a polling place open if you really want to do that, or you have you that kind of in person, in -person at the uh, town clerk's office. The only thing is you got to up the security a little. I mean, have a real ballot box there with, you know, a couple of locks and keys thrown into a vault at night or something. You know, I mean, you got to have a little, you can't just give it. I don't like the give it to the town clerk solution because it isn't always the town clerk. It's another employee. And where does it go? Where does your ballot go when you, put, when you mail it? How does it arrive um, at your, in your town hall? Where does it go then? And how does it arrive at the uh, place where they count them? And the answer is, well, you don't know. And thinking about um, that, too, the idea that what fraud exists is most likely insider, then that really elevates the important, uh, importance of chain of custody. Right. Yeah. 
That's, that's a chain of custody of ballots. This is an area where Connecticut is uh, particularly weak. Uh, okay, so let's talk about uh, the audit that is required by the state. Sure. And what may or may not be in the future, and yeah. what you do to make it better. Okay, well, yeah. So, uh, first of all, I'd say the audit is under attack, and we lost one, one round this year, and it's under threat. Uh, the attack was that uh, registrar of voters finally won the game. I want, I, you know, we had a compromise bill. Uh, I would cut this. I would agree to, from my standpoint, cut the size of the audit in half, in return so for a whole bunch of things that would strengthen the audit. So instead of saving 50% uh, of the effort, it only saved 40%. Mm -hmm. And the legislature, in their wisdom, uh, threw everything else out of my bill that I had negotiated a couple so years ago. Just reduced. With the, just reduced the audit to 5% from 10%. So our, our audit is gonna be half the size. Oh, uh, it wow. started with the uh, August primary, because the law went in effect in July. So it started with the August primary. And so instead of having uh, you know 74 or whatever, we'll have uh, 37 or so districts uh, chosen for the oh, audit. Wow. Yep. Now, it's also, I said it's under threat. So, uh, over my live body, <laughs> the legislature uh, passed a law uh, two years ago that said uh, that we could do all electronic auditing, provided the secretary, you know, and that we had to be by a method approved by the secretary of state. Okay, what does that even mean? Well, electronic auditing uh, means, uh, I guess, that you don't have people count the ballots. You, and you just put it in a different machine. You put it in, well, yeah, and uh, you know, and I don't even think the law, I, I have to look at or. the text, but you can put it into a similar machine, a different machine, and then you take that. So, you know, what we had, there was this famous book by Beth Harris called Black Box Voting. And the idea of that is, you know, you put your ballot in a ballot box. Uh, or electronic machine, and then a tape comes out and says Hillary right. won or Trump won or whatever. But you don't know what that machine did. You don't even know right. if the machine did anything other than the tape was already there. So if you take the ballots and you run them through a different machine, and all that happens is the machine pumps out uh, a tape that says, oh, the original result was right or something like that. That's, you know, it may have some numbers on there that match the original result, but you have no guarantee of that. So that's the worst kind of electronic hmm. audit. I call that black box auditing. Okay, you know, it's like somebody say, you know, uh, putting uh, I, uh, icing on a mud pie. Well, this is putting uh, mud icing on a mud <laughs> pie, you know, um, and feel good on it. Okay, a sham. Uh, so the Secretary of State has the right to do that. Now, there's actually a good way to do electronic auditing. I'm actually very much in favor of it. In fact, I was part of stimulating the state and in oh. some regards the nation in uh, doing, you know, working on electronic auditing. Unfortunately, uh, the way the state has demonstrated in the past is a way that's just what I said, black box auditing. Um, but, there, but I've kept trying to write the bill so the legislature would pass the bill so it put some assurances yeah. in there. Much like when I talk about a constitutional amendment for a national right. popular vote, it isn't just that, it's a few assurances on it at a high level. Um, so I'm still hoping, the Secretary of State has not implemented it. Uh, we met with uh, Deputy or Assistant Secretary of State Peggy Reeves a couple months ago and she assured us if they did it in the presidential election, it would just be a prototype of a few districts. I mm. requested if they do a prototype, they do they either audit those same districts by hand as well, or mm. they prototype auditing those in a way that would satisfy me. Um, and we have not heard. Uh, you know, I've asked over and over for the Secretary of State to put me any on any team they have. Uh, you know, to to try and figure out how to do this. Um, so we'll see, but that's under threat, and that threat is very real, and Maryland just lost this year. Maryland, for the very first time since 2007, they were supposed to go to optical scan machines instead of touch screens. This year, for the first time, they have optical scan machines, and they 
implemented a feel-good audit. I was part of a team of people that wrote an op-ed that appeared in the Baltimore Sun about two weeks ago trying to get the election board, they don't have it in law there, but they have an electoral board, trying to get the board to do the right thing with that audit and not do this feel-good audit, which by the way is costing them uh, about double based per, per voter what Connecticut uh, pays for their manual audit when we have the 10% manual audit. So if, if there were going to be a, an effective uh, electronic audit, what, what kind of safeguards are you talking about? Well, the, the trick is to audit the audit machine. Okay, and one thing is audit machines should produce what's known as a cast vote record. And that's a record of how each vote was counted by, each ballot was counted by ah. that machine. And so, so not just totals. Not just totals. And there's essentially two things. So what you have to do is export those totals to the public and say, these are the totals. Uh, so I say, put them on a, 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 a DVD or a CD and give them to two or three people that are at the audit. Then those people can take those numbers, either there or later on, because they're published, they're, and they can go and add them up with a spreadsheet of their own and say, sure. as the total printed out by your audit machine, the same as the totals of all those cast vote records. The other element is to randomly choose single ballots and pick them out and uh, then compare them to the record that was created by that machine by that yeah. ballot, okay? And you really should have no unexplained errors in that. So there right. are people that don't quite fill out the bubble right, right. so you know, th th those are understandable. So I'll give you an example. People said, what if, what if we randomly chose ballots in um, Maryland, okay, to get 95% sure. insurance? This is that the uh, election was correctly decided. Not that the results are accurate, but the, but the right. election in Maryland, let's say Hillary, I think, took yeah. Maryland. Um, 86 ballots statewide. Statewide. 86. All they would randomly pick 86 ballots statewide. Uh, in fact, that, I believe that was a polling on it. That wasn't even comparing them. If you picked 86 oh. ballots and you said, how many for Clinton, how many for Trump? Okay. That, and if it came out with Clinton, you'd have a 95% accuracy that Clinton had won. And it sounds it, like the statisticians their closest, were not Their closest consulted. congressional race, I believe, was something like 280, because it has to do with how close the race is. Mm. Something like 280 ballots that they would have to look at for the mm. whole state of Maryland. So, you know, the way I proposed the law that for all, they can, they can audit as many districts they want in one day by the Secretary of State. They can audit mm. all of them they're selected, or they can audit a third of them, or they can audit one in a location, and all they'd have to do is 20 to 40 ballots that they'd have to check. At each location. At each location and each day. Uh, so it's very, so basically what you're doing is that second machine is auditing the election, hmm. but your hand, you're doing a random sample. And what I compare it to people is that people always overestimate how many people you gotta do. So I give the example, you know, what do you wanna do a presidential poll in California to see who's at in California? And you wanna do a presidential poll in uh, Wyoming, okay? The accuracy of the poll basically depends on how many voters you poll. I mean, plus yeah. some other things about did you pick them randomly, did, you know. But it doesn't matter that California is a lot bigger than uh, right. Wyoming. You still, if you if you call up a thousand voters in each case, you have about the same level of confidence in the result. If you call fifty voters in each case, you have about the same mm -hmm. confidence. So you could audit California and Wyoming after the election, and and you'd still be only doing, if, depending on the margins, you'd right. still be doing basically the same number of ballots to audit the state, no matter how big it is. It's sort of like. Uh, one of, the, one of the experts on this uh, says, you know, how salty is the soup? You got a big vat of soup in here. How much soup do you have to taste to uh, tell yeah. how salty it is? You got a little cup of soup. How much soup? You, same right. with the ocean, really, except that, of course it changes from place to place. But the ocean, you don't have to drink uh, gallons and gallons of uh, seawater to tell if it's salty.
So this is the kind of thing that we'd have to think about in terms if we're doing a national popular vote also. Absolutely, absolutely. Actually, if we had a uniform system, it would be very easy to audit a national popular vote. Depending on how close it is, you know, you might have to do you might have to do that that eighty six votes. If it's you know a little closer than that, like in two thousand, and this time you might have to do quite a few more than that. Now, what does the Connecticut audit look like, and um, what do your citizen observers do? Okay, so you know, because you, you're <laughs> one of them begging the question. I, so yeah, what we do is is the Secretary of State randomly selects. Now 5% of the districts wow. in, the, in the state for audit. And there's some- The registrars probably like that. I know I have spoken to our local registrars and right. they, they yeah. don't like the audit. Well, you know, they're kind they, of, it's kind of like an organiza organized resistance to it. You know, and they, they do it sometimes, sometimes. And I yeah. want to say some people do a really good job of it. Some registrars, that, registrars are fine of it because they get selected quite often. They just know yeah. how to do it. They get paid by the hour most yeah. in a lot of places. Their staff does, uh, and others actually, you know, actively resist it. And when you resist something, you know, it's like, yeah. you know, you like brushing your teeth. You know, my wife says I should do it two minutes every night. You know, I, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's whatever you resist is, you yeah. know, it, and so many of them resist it. If, uh, you know, if they didn't resist it, they'd probably do a better job of it, and they, and some of them get done sooner because they, they just don't set it up right. And uh, yeah, so that's what so, we do. We look at it, we see what happens. So I get information from citizen observers like yourself, yeah. and we say, how did it go? And many times it goes very, very well. And then we get all the data from the Secretary of right. State's office, and then we compile all the data, and we make an independent report to the public and the legislature, and you can go to ctelectionaudit.org, and you can see all of our reports there. Uh, and right now, if you go there at the very yeah, top of the page, you can actually learn more about the observing, and you can sign up for it. We asked you, Yeah. we only asked you for one day, and, uh, and Which may but, be potentially a long day. You never really you know. You never Some really know, and, and especially at presidential, we have a lot more balance to count in each district. Um, but you sign up uh, for a distance you're willing to travel, say 50 miles from your town, 35 miles from your town, and then a number of days that you're willing, particular days you're willing to do it. You only sign up for one day, but uh, but then we try and match you up with an audit that's actually occurring near you. Right, but in not in your own town. Not in your own town. But I, I encourage people to sign up for at least 35 miles in at least three weekdays. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know. I notice when you choose the dates, like Thanksgiving is in, or whatever is in the dates that right. you can choose, but I doubt that any municipalities are Right, but quite it. a few do it Friday after Thanksgiving they because they, the people are available. They want to... They want to use election officials who have, a lot of them have regular jobs, so they, they're available on that Friday. There's a lot of times we have audits on a Saturday, very, very seldom on a Sunday. Now, what kind of things have turned up in the past uh, that are concerning in uh, how towns conduct their audits? Well, yeah, so first of all, we have uncovered things very much like you saw in New London, where uh, a significant number of write-in ballots were read in again, like 151 right. is the record. Uh, and it should have been detected earlier, okay? The other thing that happens is every time there's a difference between the results of the hand count and the machine count, uh, the towns that don't really try and resolve that, they put it in as like human error. They assume the machine counted right and they counted wrongly, and the Secretary of State's office not only yeah. accepts that, they encourage that. So the answer is, if you're auditing that way, is what I say is, whenever or if ever there was a, diff a discrepancy, you're not going to recognize it because you attribute all these differences to human error. And that could be the case, but it is not necessarily the case. Right. We only have a few minutes left, and I was going to uh, have you once again tell people how they can sign up. And I've done this for... Uh, quite a few years. It's really interesting. Towns vary a lot in how they do it. Uh, I'm convinced that in some towns, the people who are counting don't know what the purpose of the counting is because um, of, 
like people who don't fill out the form correctly, like they make weird squiggles or whatever, it's not the same as a recount that you're looking at voter intent. You're trying to figure out what the machine should right. have done or right. would have done. Right. Uh, so there seems to be a, still a fair bit of confusion in some towns that the counters are not really sure what the purpose of the audit is. Right. And it's, you know, in, in bills in the state legislature, laws really don't have in them the purpose. And you got to kind of deduce the purpose. Uh, and I think the purpose is, uh, and it isn't the purpose that I would have, but the purpose is to uh, determine the uh, accuracy of our voting machines. And it fails that purpose because they don't pursue it far enough to know what, the, you know, when there's a difference, whether it's a discrepancy or it's a bad hand count or a machine made a mistake, or maybe that sleepy election official put the write-ins in twice. So if someone wants, is interested in doing this, they can go to the website ctelectionaudit.org. Exactly. Or I think there is probably a link from uh, CT Voters Count. Bet it's better to go to ctelectionaudit.org. Okay. And, uh, you know, now's the time to sign up. Uh, we have uh, telephone training uh, starts this Friday, uh, and it goes Friday. There's another one on Sunday, and there's two sessions uh, a week from uh, to Tuesday, the day this broadcast is airing. Uh, so now's the time to sign up and yeah. uh, be part of this. Um, I would say that m many people find it fascinating. It's a good uh, introduction to what goes on in, in the part of elections yeah. people aren't used to. And finally, I'd say I'm very proud that five of our observers have gone on and become uh, registrars of voters. Mm -hmm. And That's another one has gone on and become uh, a regional administrator. And many people have gone on to become election officials uh, from their experience with this. Uh, so, you know, this is, this is absolutely uh, one, of, one of our proudest achievements. But just uh, citizens finding out what's going on and understanding this is uh, a great value. And for anyone who's intimidated at all about it, I have always found that the, uh, ele the staff there, the registrars, the counters, are really welcoming. They 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 kind of don't want to think that they're doing this thing in a room and no one notices what effort they're putting in. And they seem to appreciate that there are people out there who who care that they're doing this. They complain to me when we don't observers don't show up. They actually they actually do that. Uh, so that yeah, that's uh, that's good. They, and we also, if it's your first time doing it, we have an absolute rule that we assign you. With, some. with with someone else because it, it just doesn't work going out there alone that first time and uh, even the two people that haven't done it before it's much better to go with someone that's experienced well thank you luther uh, i'm sure we could have gone on for another hour i had a list of things i didn't ask but uh you know you'll be back and uh, i recommend to everyone go to C ctelectionaudit.org and sign up uh, it would be great to see more people out there. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you. I didn't talk.